Rocky Marciano never faced an opponent he couldn't beat. But one night, before he became champion, Rocky stepped into the ring to face two foes in the most crucial test of his historic career. Carmine Vingo was nicknamed Bingo Vingo for his willingness to take chances to win in the ring. Vingo started his career by winning 16 of his first 17 professional bouts, losing only a questionable decision to undefeated Brooklyn heavyweight prospect Joe Lindsay in 1948. Vingo would then win 12 consecutive fights, including a unanimous decision over the highly regarded Joe Monzele on a boxing card at Yankee Stadium in August of 1949. A second round knockout of Al Robinson at Sunnyside Garden in Queens, New York propelled Vingo into the world heavyweight rankings and a crossroads bout with rising Rocky Marciano. The Marciano-Vingo fight itself was a Pier 6 brawl. Vingo would go down for a nine count in the first round from two solid left hooks from Marciano. Marciano would drop him again for a nine count in the second, with again with the left. Both fighters would tire badly in the middle stages of the fight, arm weary after the heavy early going. It wasn't all Marciano in the early rounds. Vingo, fighting back wildly when hurt, rocked the highly touted Marciano with solid rights to the jaw in the second. He almost went down. Ebbets warned both for hitting low in the fourth and warned Marciano again early in the sixth. He said he would have taken away the round if the bout hadn't ended. The low blow had nothing to do with the knockout wallop. A clean shot to the head sprawled Vingo on his back. Referee Harry Ebbets, a former light heavyweight boxer, said Vingo banged his head hard on the ring padding when he went down from a left uppercut. I was watching closely, said Ebbets. He really got a very hard bang when he went down. I wouldn't have let him continue if he had been able to get up. I took out his mouthpiece at the count of three. He seemed pretty strong at the end of the fifth round, but I noticed he was tiring after the, after the first minute of the sixth. I was hoping the round would soon be over. Jackie Levine, Carmine Vingo's manager, said, We wanted to stop the fight, but under the rules, we weren't allowed to enter the ring while a fight is on. Rocky Marciano sat on a bench in a corridor of New York's St. Clair's Hospital. As tears trickled down his cheeks, he remained hunched over, staring at his hands. It was around 11.30 the night of December 30th, 1949. Through the door on his right, doctors were working furiously on Carmine Bingo, working to save his life by relieving the pressure from a blood clot on his brain, and Rocky, who sat there and prayed, was thinking he'd never fight again. Marciano's sledgehammer fists had pounded Carmine into a helpless hulk an hour or so before in Madison Square Garden, just a few blocks away from the hospital. Experienced ringsiders could tell from the strange look in Vingo's eyes as his seconds tried to revive him that this was no ordinary knockout, that something was seriously wrong. Commission Dr. Vincent Nardiello knew it as he flashed his fingers in front of the stricken fighter's face. Get the stretcher, Nardiello ordered. He's going to the hospital. Marciano was informed in his dressing room. Deeply concerned, he pulled on a shirt and a pair of pants and rushed to the hospital. A priest was leaving Vingo's room and approached Rocky. Why, Father? Marciano pleaded. Why? The priest put his arm around the distressed fighter and led him down another corridor to the hospital chapel. Nobody, of course, knows what was said. But when Rocky came back, he was a little more composed. He refused to leave the corridor until he knew about Vingo one way or the other. Shortly before dawn, Rocky prayed again. But this time it was a prayer of thanks because Vingo had passed the crisis. He would live, and in later years, become one of Rocky's closest friends. 
But Vingo's recovery was not the end of Rocky's worries. His toughest battle was about to begin. The battle to see whether or not he could ever step inside a ring again. How deeply, people wondered, had the portrait of Vingo, lying on that hospital bed, so near death, been etched into Rocky's mind. Could he ever fight again? It happened to other fighters. Some, while not quitting altogether, instinctively pulled their punches. Others never made it back at all. Marciano would have to make the same decision. He prayed for help. And the help came from an unexpected source. Carmine Vingo. Vingo, the man Rocky almost killed, pleaded with Marciano not to give up. It was probably Vingo's influence more than anything else that persuaded Rocky to again don the gloves. And when he went back into training, Carmine Vingo was there, rooting him on. Marciano would not only be fighting for himself now. He had promised that partially paralyzed Vingo a percentage of all his future purses. Still, Marciano's handlers were worried. At the training camp, Rocky pulled no punches. He whomped his sparring partners with the same brain-jarring blows that had knocked out 23 of his 25 opponents. But what couldn't be determined in the training camp was how he'd react in the ring. The moment of truth would come on the night of March 24, 1950, against Roland Lestarza, a college-educated heavyweight with a strong New York following. Lestarza, like Marciano, was undefeated. More than 13,000 fans packed Madison Square Garden to see the New England slugger, undefeated in 26 fights, meet the hometown boy, undefeated in 37 fights. They also came to see what effect, if any, the Vingo tragedy had on Rocky. Everyone's doubts were soon laid to rest. Rocky had come to fight, and if he was pulling his punches, you couldn't prove it by La Starza. In the fourth, Rocky floored Roland for an eight count with a long overhand right to the head, and in the eighth, he cut La Starza over both eyes. However, Rocky also lost some rounds, notably the very same eighth, when, after a warning for low blows, he let another wild swing go low. The round was taken away from him, and the fans knew that unless there was a knockout in the ninth or the tenth, the fight would be very close. It was. One judge had it five to four and one even for Rocky. The other judge saw it five to four and one even for the Starza. The referee, upon whose card the decision now rested, came up with a five to five score. A draw? No. Earlier that year, Boxing Commissioner Eddie Egan had ordered that in such situations the referee would use a point system within rounds to break any ties. The referee's points were 9-6 to six in favor of Marciano, and the crowd didn't like it. But for Marciano, it was more than just another victory. He had overcome the effects of the Vingo fight. There were no psychological scars remaining. The Carmine Vingo who remained with Marciano after that fight was a friend, and not, as many had predicted, a ghost, which would haunt Rocky for years to come. It would be these fights with Carmine Vingo and Roland Lestarza that Rocky earned the mental toughness to be able to take on the likes of Ezra Charles later in his career. Marciano out of his corner, postponed 48 hours because of the weather, the fight starts briskly. Rocky in the black trunks weighs 187. Charles in the white trunks is five and a half pounds heavier. The referee is Al Burrow. Marciano won the world heavyweight title on September 23rd, 1954 by knocking out Jersey Joe Walcott in 13 rounds of Philadelphia. As a Charles held the title for 10 months. He lost it to Walcott in July of 1951. Rocky Marciano, grim and determined. As a Charles, hooking away with that left hand. Charles beating Marciano to the punch. That's the end of round one. This is the second time these two have met. Marciano winning a close 15 round decision exactly three months ago.
There's the Charles trying to keep Rocky Marciano off at long range. Hits him with a good right hand. Marciano strong as a bull, though. Good right hand by Rocky Marciano. Charles may be hurt. Marciano going after Ezra Charles. And Charles goes down. He's up on the count of two. Marciano swarming in. Looking in the end of the fight right here and now. Ezra Charles fighting back well. That's the end of round two. Charles out of his corner for the fifth round. He's beginning to show less of the caution and more of the skill that won the first round for him. Is it Charles, hoping to become the first man in history to win the heavyweight crown again. Rocky Marciano seems tireless, constantly wailing away with lefts and rights to the body. Is it Charles holding on now? But Marciano keeps belting away. Is it Charles fighting back well? But again, Marciano holds the upper hand. Marciano will miss a few. When he lands, they really hurt. The end of round five. Watch Marciano out of his corner. Grim determination. This sixth round sees Charles making another nice start of the round. But before the three minutes are over, it's Marciano's round again. Rocky has won all of his 46 professional bouts, 42 of them by knockouts. The challenger is backing away, making Rocky's style of attack all the more effective. Rocky slowly wearing his man down. But Charles is a real cagey veteran, having won 87 of his 99 professional bats. Climax in a few seconds. Marciano's nose has been split into two ribbons of flesh, and his handlers have covered it with a Pinocchio like bandage. And that nose is a target for Ezra Charles, and a legitimate target. In their last fight, the champion was slowed up by a gash under his left eye. And Charles knows it's one way to slow him up again, if possible. But Marciano's aggressiveness is not making it easy. Is it Charles beginning to show the signs of wear and tear? Good combination punches by Rocky Marciano. Charles may be in trouble again. The end of round seven. The eighth round has hardly started before Charles is to open a cut under Rocky's right eye. But this was to be the final dramatic round of the fight. And from here on out, it's just a case of the bleeding champion measuring his man for size. Marciano's eye and nose are badly cut, but his mean, hard punches are definitely weakening the challenger. Down he goes!
Once more, a chance to see the punch that sent him down. There it is. He's on his way. Rocky is all business. Charles getting up, but he's dazed. And the champion now has him at his mercy. The knockout punches are on their way. those six punches in succession. One, two, three, four, and that's it. The time, two minutes, 36 seconds of the eighth round, winner by a knockout, and still heavyweight champion of the world, Rocky Marciano. Vingo would not regain consciousness for three weeks. He would become paralyzed for two years. His right leg would still be stiff, and he would be partially blind in both eyes. He couldn't drive a car, he couldn't walk that good, and he couldn't put on his pants without leaning against the wall. Vingo's name would fade from the boxing spotlight. After getting out of the hospital, he would marry his high school sweetheart, Kathy, and find work as a security guard at an office building on Broadway in Manhattan. He would marry his high school sweetheart, Kathy, and they would move in with their parents. Carmine Vingo said, All the neighbors thought we were rich because of all the rumors that we were collecting thousands from all over the place. What a laugh. The only money we got was from Kathy working. Vingo realized that there were no and are no pension plans for fighters. And another belief was that Rocky Marciano was helping Vingo financially. In fact, after Marciano died in a plane crash on August 31, 1969, the New York Times obituary read, quote, Despite his reputation for conservative spending, Marciano had a list of beneficiaries to whom he sent money regularly. One of these was Carmine Vingo. Kathy Vingo, Carmine's wife, disputes the claim. The only thing we ever got from Rocky were promises, she said. He'd tell Carmine that he'd have something for him soon, to put him in some business, that he had some property for him in Florida, that he'd have a benefit for him. Nothing. Each man is for himself in the fight game. That's the game. But Carmine held no grudges. I didn't care, he said, but my wife gets mad about it. I didn't push Rocky or Al Weil, his manager. Maybe if I'd have pushed, but I'm not the type. Rocky, he was one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to talk to. I'd go up to his training camp in the mountains, and I was at his wedding and met his family. Wonderful people, his aunts and cousins and uncles. And I went to his funeral, paid my own way. My wife came in one morning and said, Carmine, I got terrible news. The radio said Rocky Marciano was killed in a plane crash. I never asked Rocky for nothing. But he did send me two tickets for a second fight in Chicago with Jersey Joe Walcott. Sent two round trip plane tickets too. And you know, I never did get my purse from my fight with Rocky. It was $1,500. It went for doctor bills. I had four private nurses and the whole bill was about four grand. I still don't know who paid. It could have been Rocky. But he only got 1500 too and he couldn't have had much money because he was just starting out just like me. He didn't start making it big till after our fight. On June 2, 2015, Carmine Vingo would die of natural causes at his home in Bronx, New York. He was 85 years old.